And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. This is the local talk radio, but we are streaming live on the Internet and around the world at KFAR660.com. Now, in the studio with us this morning, our sponsors of the program from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And from our other sponsor, Far North Tactical, it's Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And we have, uh, well, our entire phone bank is already full. That's because we got a super sweet guest on today. Well, would you like to introduce him before we actually light up his line? Yes, Mr. Richard Mayberry is on with us today with uh, the U.S. World, U.S. and World Early Warning Report. But most of you probably know him from his Uncle Eric series of books, including Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, and most of our favorites, Whatever Happened to Justice, which has been a huge, well, anyone that I've given the book to, it's been a huge impact on their life. So, Mr. Mayberry, Richard, I should say, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you very much for being on the program with us today. Um, why don't you just take some time to tell us about yourself, and and we'll probably all just sit back and like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, <laughs> I never know where to start when I'm... I'm asked that. Um, uh, I write uh, a financial newsletter called U.S. and World Early Warning Report that is uh, designed to or intended to look at uh, the big picture, the geopolitical and economic picture in the U.S. and around the world and try to derive some sort of economic forecast from that and then uh, to make uh, investment recommendations and other financial recommendations. Um, I was, uh, you know, I've been doing that like uh, about more than 20 years. Before that, I was a freelance writer. Uh, I wrote for the Wall Street Journal and USA, USA Today and some other large publications. Um, I've been a, uh, um, a teacher uh, of uh, junior high and high school kids. Uh, I was uh, in the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, 605th Special Operations Squadron. Uh, I've been a forklift driver and a carpenter. <laughs> How far do you want me to go with no, this? <laughs> well, what? Uh, oh, by the way, if you guys want to know, his uh, website is chaosstan.com. C H A O S T A N dot com, like chaos stand or. Any of the stands over there, Mr. Maybert Richards is a chaos stand. Um, what? How did the uh, Uncle Eric books transpire? I mean, what? How did that come about? Where you wrote? What was the uh, inspiration for that? I guess. Well, um, since I was a teacher, um, I um, realized that there is a whole lot of things that are taught in the schools. Uh, especially in the government-owned and controlled schools that um, don't have the full story. Um, They are designed to make the kids uh, think that there are all sorts of political and legal questions out there that are settled. They're done deals. It's the way the world's made, and we all just live with it and and try to, uh, you know, live our lives from there. And, um, And I realized, you know, because of the experiences I had in the Air Force, uh, where I was involved in covert warfare operations in Central and South America, that what the public is told and what's in the school books has absolutely no connection with reality. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, I, you know, I was a writer. I had a degree in business and economics. And um, I was uh, beginning to become aware that not only was this the case in uh, geopolitics and military affairs, but it was in economics and finance and investments and, and all, too, that what the kids are taught is just not the full story. And in many cases, it's very misleading and dangerous and can make you broke. Uh, so, uh, you know, started writing the, the Uncle Eric books, which are a series of letters um, from an economist to his niece or nephew, explaining things that the niece or nephew is asking about the world around them, you know, and looking for explanations. Hey, this is uh, Aaron. I, um, mm-hmm. I read 
I'm trying to read every single book you've ever written, but I have two or three left to go. I give uh, Whatever Happened to Justice away to as many people as I can. I buy them, I put them in my storefront and give them away for free. And I've definitely given one to just about every friend, so all two people I know. I'm <laughs> I've well, given, thank you. I've given away quite a few of that book, and it's not so much the, um, the format of... Um, Obviously, they're really easy to understand. They're written for um, grade school level. But it's more your um, ability to take history and give a, are you kidding me, no-duh look on it. <laughs> that struck me as, I mean, I'm a big fan of history. It's, I devote most of my time to reading history. And you just, you're able to uh, make your point in case based on pretty much just history. I mean, you prove. I mean, you take economics, the whole nine yards, and just take history and slap it in people's face. That's what struck me more than the fact that it's written for a grade school level. Which, by the way, your grade school level, mm-hmm. I would say only about 25% of my friends I've given it to have got it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's it. And when we we talk about grade school level, we're talking about the reading level. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, as far as a person's experience and, and ability to absorb, you know, that's up to the individual, I guess. Um, they're written to be very easy to understand and, and easy to go through quickly. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I remember um, the simplest of all the books is Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, which is at an eighth grade reading level. And um, as you know, the, the economics in there is is extremely um, oh I don't know easy let's you know um, you know very easy to grasp and yet I can remember um, a, an aunt of mine reading it and saying she just didn't get it um, and and she couldn't say more than that. she couldn't explain anything else she just could all she could say is I don't get it I don't get it well she's been taught a whole lot of things that aren't so, but she thinks they are so, and those things contradict what's in my book, and so she can't resolve them. And, you know, that's where we get to something called a paradigm shift. A paradigm is a model of how the world works. Uh, it's like the, your mental blueprint of how uh, your life on this, this world works. And... Um, she had been taught a a paradigm or a model that uh, totally contradicted reality. <laughs> I, well, and, and I guess the best example is, and a point I make in that little book all all the time is that um, nothing is free. There's an old old principle called Tanstoffel, and Tanstoffel means there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and uh, yet she had been told all of her life that the government was going to provide her with all sorts of free stuff, and she just couldn't get it that that uh, the government does not provide free stuff. The government robs Peter to subsidize Paul. Uh, now, Paul is free, but it's not free to Peter. <laughs> yeah. Even then, though, Richard, hey, this is this is Steve, by the way. I, I don't think even it's not even really free to the person that is being subsidized because of all of the strings that are attached. Yes. Any time that you suckle the teat, you have to take all of the milk that comes with it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm I'm fascinated with this idea of paradigm shift. I went through one myself in the, somewhat in the last three years or so, and a lot of it for me was that I was dealing with some cognitive dissonance, it's just in, in my head between things that I knew instinctually were wrong, but I, I kept on saying, oh, this is right. Things like going to war. And voting. And, well, and voting. <laughs> you know, I still haven't completely made the shift on that one, but I, 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 how much does a paradigm shift and cognitive dissonance go together? I mean, do, do people really recognize yeah. that, you know, hey, look, there is no such thing as a free lunch, but they're just pretending that there is? Uh, or, or do they really honestly believe that there is a free lunch? Well, I think most of them believe there's a free lunch. They're told in in their school history classes that the government um, has all of these responsibilities to take care of us. And, you know, we're a bunch of helpless sheep, and we need this shepherd to take care of us. And uh, 
they they think that's reality. That think they think that's what's really going on. And and so you provide them with a model that says, actually, no. What's really going on is we are taking care of the government by force. Um, and um, you know they can't get it. It's it just all their lives they've lived with this this paradigm that they were taught in school. Now you talk about cognitive dissonance. Yes, that's exactly what my aunt was experiencing. Is this inability to fit reality in with what she was taught in school, and so she is faced with this this uh, pressure to either throw out what she was taught in school or uh, to throw out the reality that she's witnessing every day. That's one of the things I try to do in the Uncle Eric books is is bring people to uh, to be aware of the reality they are experiencing. They you actually see all sorts of things going on around you that you never saw before after you read those books. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you did a very good job with them, that's for sure. Thank you, yeah. Ancient I, Rome. So go ahead. That used to, I mean, that was my big thing. Is I read I read uh, Whatever Happened to Justice. I got really excited about it because I got it. And so I just kept ordering them off the Internet and giving them away to everybody thinking I was changing the world. And you're right, there's just so many shut it out. And Mm-hmm. It has to be directly linked to public school. I mean, the first time I read it, it was no, it was, I didn't have any um, hard time choking it down. Let's just say that. <laughs> but uh, and well, but you, I didn't go to public school. Right. I was homeschooled, and oh. I mean, like, I grew up reading stuff like Vic Lockman's Economics and Comics, you know, and it's the same line of thinking. So if, to read your book was just. You know, you bring the law. The, what I appreciate about it, you bring the law and economics into it in one. And your statement that all lawyers should be economists and all economists should go to law school, I think that rings mm. so true. Yes, right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you, t- you bring up homeschooling there. I have come to the conclusion that that's, that's one of the primary things that has to happen for us to save our country and the world is people have got to start raising their kids themselves. Children should be raised by people who love them. And those schools do not love your children. (laughs) We agree wholeheartedly. (laughs) I was, uh, Aaron and I were brothers, and we were both homeschooled, and Steve Floyd, who helps host the show with us here, he uh, has seven kids mm-hmm. and they're all homeschooled i have eight kids and we homeschool them all so we definitely uh, agree on that mm-hmm. there's uh eight well not 18 years 12 years of indoctrination that you don't have to worry about well more, more than that though because uh, josh i not only went to a public school after that i went to a public university mm-hmm. and then i went into the army so I, I have a good full 20-plus years yeah, Steve's of indoctrination. Pretty much so we got about three years left just to unscramble him. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got through reading your uh, World War One and World War Two. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think I can say anything except for you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, we, we've got, by the way, we've got all four of our our uh, caller lines on hold waiting to speak to you because people uh, heard somehow that you were going to be on the program this morning, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it would probably be pretty good radio if we could get in a couple of calls before sure. the the bottom of the hour. Sure, go ahead. Well, that's yeah. Let's take a couple of calls and then we have some more questions, specific questions to ask you. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're on with Richard Mayberry. Hi, is this me? It, it might be. It depends on who it is. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Um, I'm, hey, Richard. I'm Daniel from Connecticut. Oh, uh, glad to meet you. Oh, I'm. It's such an honor for me. I'm a subscriber to uh, the EWR, and I want to thank you not only for the EWR, but I have a child. I'm a blessed father with a child on the spectrum, and I know that. Uh, you do a lot of uh, charitable work for uh, kids with autism. Thank you. Oh, yes, um, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a question. Uh, I know I have to go quick on this. Uh, my question is, um, I've been studying a lot for economics for a long time, and I've come across guys like Gary Allen and G. Edward Griffith, and I didn't know how you analyze or how much weight you put into the conspiracies of the banking families, uh, maybe even going back to the Medici's and Peruzzi's, uh, the Adam Weishop Illuminati and the Karl Marx, uh, that their idea is that the elite families, the banking families, want total control 
And from uh, Professor Quigley, we understand through economics, they're trying to promote the socialism. Do you put any weight onto that? Do you analyze that, or do you dismiss that as just conspiracy? How do you absorb that information? Well, I, I do not dismiss it. Um, I probably don't put as much weight on it as some people do. Um, I think there are conspiracies, I think, but one, uh, one way I, I um, part company with a lot of the conspiratorialists is that I don't think there's just one conspiracy. I think there are dozens, maybe hundreds or thousands of conspiracies, um, and they compete with each other because you have to. When you are living in a world that is saturated with political power, then you better get some political power or you're going to be toast. And so you live in a world where people believe in big government, and which means they believe in huge amounts of political power. So um, anybody who is reasonably intelligent after a while realizes he'd better get some political power or this other bunch are just going to eat him. Um, and so... I think that's a, a huge part of what goes on with these conspiracies. Is these, there are some of these people, no doubt, who um, want to dominate the world, and they use whatever opportunities come along to them to do that. But I think probably a very, very many more of these people uh, are simply trying to defend what they have, and there's no honorable way to defend it. When you're living in this this uh, ocean of political power, then you got to learn to swim with the sharks. And that's what winds up happening. The entire society, all of human society, is gradually being corrupted by this pressure to get some power to defend themselves against the other people who have power. Do you think they overstepped their uh, boundaries with the 07 uh, debacle? In, uh, I mean, it's almost similar as the Great Depression playbook. Do you think they overstepped their boundaries and now they're just eating their uh, own skin now? Yeah, it's, it's very possible. Um, the, um, that's a typical thing all through history that you see that uh, people who have political power usually, after a while, they begin to think of themselves as some form of superior human being who... Um, has powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, as the old <laughs> Superman show used to say. Um, and, and after they get this this feeling that they're superior to everybody else, then, yeah, they make dumb mistakes. And I appreciate I hope, the, uh, mm -hmm. I hope there's another Uncle Eric Books with an S coming out soon. <laughs> Okay, I'll thanks. think about it. Thanks for the call, Daniel. Appreciate it. Sure. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're next on with Richard. Who's this? Are you there? It's the sec. That's the deadline. No, actually, I fixed it this week. Oh. Right, uh, let's try the next one. Good morning. Who's this? Are you there? State your name. I can hear somebody on the line, but they're not answering. So we'll go to the next one, and we have now cleared the lines cool. officially. We're back with Josh. So, Richard. Yes. Um, this is Aaron again. So isn't the, that whole concept of um, almost the, the need not – basically you have to be in politics, uh, even if it's just out of self-defense. Even the mm. most uh, harmless guy ends up – I mean, you see it everywhere you go. You have rallies, people down there waving their flag from every spectrum of, of uh, politics – and is that so much because we believe so much in it, or is it because we all realize that we have to be part of it? I mean, part of that um, going for political power is um, getting your own guy in. And then, I mean, you don't have to necessarily run yourself, but the spinoff is just to get in your guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's. Uh, I run into it all the time, too. Uh, people who have absolutely no desire to get into politics, and, and they know that it's crooked as a dog's hind leg, it's filthy, it's evil, it's vicious. They know all of this, but they're still in it because they don't dare not be in it. Because if their guy isn't in power, then somebody else's guy will be, and he's going to come after the people who aren't defended. So you've got to have your guy in there. That was one of the, the themes, actually, one of the most important ones in uh, Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged. Um, Hank Reardon, the hero, finds he has utter contempt for, for politics and for government, but
but he finds himself dragged into it because he is being absorbed by this creature, <laughs> this political creature, and he has to defend himself somehow. Uh, and and that's what happens to all of us. If you know those of us who um, are just ordinary people trying to go about our lives, raise our kids, enjoy life, find that we're sucked into this evil because we have to be, um, or or we're totally undefended and and we'll simply be bankrupted. Well, Richard, that's Steve again. One of the issues I think that uh, is addressed there in Ayn Rand is that issue of pull. If you have the right pull with the right people then you become part of the ruling class. And if you don't have pull, you just be, uh, you, you get pushed around. Mm-hmm. And you see that happening here at the local level with our borough right now. Mm-hmm. The people with pull end up getting jobs created for them out of thin air with the, uh, with the rest of our money. money the, the jobs that aren't needed, jobs that then once they go away because the political will changes and the people rise up and say, get rid of this program, they just they keep the people on staff and find a new program for them. How do you change that without being a part of the political system? Well, um, I have become a lot more optimistic lately than I have been since at least the 1970s because um, I think that question of of what do we do about it is beginning to go away. Um, these governments uh, around the world, uh, it's, it's pretty much totally universal – that all governments have swallowed the poison pill of socialism, and they're all beginning to die from it. And the economic chaos you see around you is is sort of the last gasp of all of these governments uh, desperately looking for ways to keep themselves in business. And um, in my last issue of uh, Early Warning Report, I, I drew the parallels with uh, what happened in the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet Union wasn't conquered. Uh, it wasn't overrun by an invading army. It just poisoned itself to death with socialism. And it just, you know, the Soviet government just went out of business. And I think that, you know, the whole world now is going down that road where all of these governments, including the U.S. government, have become so corrupt, so saturated with robbing Peter to subsidize Paul that they are, in effect, destroying themselves. You see this most clearly in Europe because they were the furthest down the road to uh, total socialism. And, And so, you know, I don't think we need to direct our energies anymore to what do we do to stop it because they're all committing suicide what we need to do is direct our energies toward what comes after i think there's going to be an enormous catastrophe economic catastrophe coming it'll make the great depression of the 1930s look tame by comparison as all of these governments go down and um, there, were, it's going to be one emergency after another all over the world. Um, military leaders will be called on to come in and do something. And, of course, they won't have the slightest idea what to do. But they will be called in to handle the riots and the other uh, turmoil that will develop. And it will be up to those military leaders to decide what will be next. Uh, what, what kind of new system will there be? And and uh, an appeal to, that I make to people all the time is: if you know somebody in the U.S. military, please, if you if they have an open mind, um, introduce them to the U.S. Constitution, especially the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Those are the two amendments that most severely limit the government's power, or should. Uh, limited. The Supreme Court has almost totally ignored the existence of those two amendments. But if the military, you know, everybody in the military takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, uh, they do not take an oath to support and defend the political structure uh, in Washington, the bureaucracy, the IRS. <laughs> they take an oath to support okay, and defend now? the Constitution. Okay, and, um, you know, I, I hope that 
you know, our listeners, when they get a chance to talk to a GI, to introduce him to the Constitution, actually get him to read it, uh, because most of them don't. They have no idea what they've taken an oath to to protect. And, and so that way, when the big catastrophe happens and all of these governments around the world go down, the U.S. military will have an idea of the direction it should go in. I, I'm more prone to give your book away. <laughs> I think... Uh, that was referring to whatever happened to justice, by the way. We're right up here on the half-hour break. We had a little technical problems there for a minute. But when we come back, are we on the break now? You know, actually, no. We're, we, we still, we're coming up on the break in about 30 seconds. Okay. So. Well, when, uh, when we get back, what you just now were talking about, I think, has totally everything to do with uh, the difference between political law and what you call higher law. Yes. And when after the break here, if we can, could you explain to us what higher law is, where it came from, the term or whatever, mm-hmm. and contradict that with what we live through right now, unfortunately, political law? Mm-hmm. Sure. All right. Thank you, Richard Maymary is with us on KFAR Local Talk Radio Online at KFAR660.com. And welcome back to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, and uh, we have verified we've got some issues going on at the transmitter site, but we are. Brown, the power's out on, still in the uh, the North Pole area. What's Hello? That? Yeah, go ahead. I just got a text from my wife. She said the power's out. Yeah, that'll, that, so. that will do it, and the power's out at the transmitter site. We're not going to be broadcasting on the airwaves. However... We are transmitting over the Internet, and uh, folks who are listening live online can still hear us, and, of course, we'll be recording the show so that uh, folks can listen to it later on. So this is not an exercise in futility. It's simply an exercise in trying to go around the system. And actually, this is one of the the scenarios that I've played out in my mind here. Uh, Richard, you still with us? Yes, I am. You know, you're talking about the coming chaos as things break apart. Uh, one of the I, I was in I was in the Army shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues that we were looking at is watching the chaos that rippled across the area. We were afraid that some of these breakaway republics were going to start regional wars mm-hmm. because you know, basically where they had had that continuous flow of materiel coming from Mother Russia, now they were going to have to go out and take stuff more locally in order to get it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me as the things break down, one of the possibilities is that we're going to see a breakdown of our... Uh, power grid in yep. the United States, and you know you can't really prepare for that, uh, except to say, well, uh, on a local level, can we take care of things uh, for ourselves, and how much can we take care of, and how much are we going to just pretty much be left it to the um, <laughs> vagaries of nature and of chance? Uh, can you answer that? Well, <laughs> that, that's a big question. Um, you're right about the uh let's let's take it first the the soviet union um they um they did have some cases of various soviet republic republics going to war against each other and that was mostly down in the caucasus area um and it was really really awful there for a while um in especially in um, the city of grozny um and uh, you know that city was practically leveled like in world war 2 um it can be that bad when they start fighting with each other and i think there will be cases of that all over the world um for exactly the reasons you're saying that the people um are accustomed to a certain standard of living, and things are going to start going away. Uh, the, you know what you thought you could get in the past, uh, you're not going to get anymore, and um, it's it's going to create a frustration and a fear, and and it already is in Europe. You can see it. Um, those people are scared. They know their system is breaking down, and they are scared. And people who are scared, people who are desperate, do desperate things. So I think we're going to have a period uh, like that. It's not going to last forever. You know, it's, uh, I would doubt that, that the really worst part of it uh, is going to last more than a year. But it's going to be really scary while it's there. And um, I, I recommend to everybody that you should have uh, emergency supplies and you should uh, be 
you know, uh, developing an emotional mindset to uh, to be ready for this. Uh, don't think that life is going to be hunky dory um, for the rest of your life. There's going to be a really nasty period. Get used to it. So um, that's the the main thing. I mean, actually, I, I think the the emotional preparation has to come first. You've got to start thinking in terms that that um, all the governments in the world, including the U.S. government, fell for a hoax called socialism, and that hoax is falling apart now, and there's going to be a transition period where things are going to be really hard. Um, so have you know, good supplies of, of food and water and medicines and all sorts of other things that are necessities of life for you, and be prepared to... Uh, to ride through some tough times. They will not last forever, but they're going to be tough for a while, and, and you need to be thinking in terms of being prepared for that. Oh, Richard, I'm sorry. I don't want to hijack the, the program here, Josh, so if you've got more questions for him, please just jump in. But one question I have on that is how do you reconcile the, the preppers in terms of the people who are getting prepared for such a thing, thinking that it's going to be long-term, versus the apocalyptic people who think that this is the end of time, and are trying to convince their neighbors that we're looking at not just a, a catastrophic collapse of our society, but of the world in, as a whole. And they're willing to take a kind of more drastic, I guess, more perhaps more drastic actions than simply those who think that this is going to last for just you know a little while. Well, um, the uh, end of the world types, um, I, I don't know how many of those there are. Um, I can see why some people would arrive at that conclusion. Um, and who knows, maybe they're going to be right. <laughs> you know, this, this is far from an exact science here, but I don't think they will be, because I have uh, studied enough history, not only of the United States, but of other countries, to see that what we're going through here is a pretty regular thing throughout all of human history. Uh, the only thing that's really different about this time is that it's the whole world. Um, before this, uh, you know, numerous times, dozens, scores, hundreds of times probably, uh, governments have gotten themselves into uh, deep financial trouble and other sorts of trouble, and they have collapsed. And um, the people, for a while, were in a, a state of extreme turmoil uh, and a lot of fear, but they came out of it. You know, you look at uh, France. That's one of the best examples. The French have gone through these sorts of things so many times. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I don't. How many French revolutions have there been? I, I, it's hard to say. I don't know. A lot of French revolutions, and yet you can go over to Paris today, and you find one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's a wonderful place to visit. Um, I've I had friends who've lived there. You know, they love the place. Um, so it doesn't last. Uh, you know, every civilization eventually comes back out of it. Well, Some, <clears throat> sometimes very quickly, and sometimes it takes a long time. Not not every single one. I mean, Carth oh. Carthage didn't make it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There, <laughs> there are some cases where uh, uh, they didn't come out of it. Uh, there's another one was, um, I think it's called Dalmedia, uh, Dalmatia. And that's not the right word. Anyhow, it's a city in northern northern uh, uh, Egypt, and uh, it just got totally wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, in fact, they didn't even try to rebuild it. They went down the river several miles and, and built a new one there. Uh, so, yeah, there's some, some cases where it's, it's really horrible. And there will be some of those cases this time, I think. There will be places where... They're just going to be turned into deserts, and, and that's it. But I don't think that'll be the case all over the world because um, there, you know, there will be a restarting. People people go to work in the morning, and they're going to continue wanting to go to work in the morning and produce whatever it is they produce, and that will bring us out of it as it has brought numerous other countries out of it. But again, it could be really tough for a little while. Coming out of it, Richard, um, I don't know the belief, and many of us are, that the only way to come out of it, I mean, the best the best hope of coming out of it is to return to basically a 
a higher law system mm -hmm. back away from political law away from the socialism and um, can you explain where higher law comes from where what's the term come from what is it and how does it compare with what we live through right now political law okay um, the way I like to explain that is to go back to the early Middle Ages around 500 AD um, the Roman Empire collapsed in the Roman Empire in the West had collapsed and um, there was there was basically nothing there but some villages uh, all through the former Roman, Roman Empire in that area and um, it was a really miserable situation it's what we call the Dark Ages um, standards of living just collapsed just absolutely fell through the floor and people went into extreme poverty they were living as badly as people had lived a thousand years earlier and um, there was no central government to speak of um, it was, it was as, bad a, as bad a picture as you can possibly imagine probably well in that case there was no law well, the law disappeared along with the Roman government and so when two people had a dispute, they had to work it out on their own. And they very quickly found out that could lead to violence, and um, not very many people wanted to be settling disputes that way. Um, the ones who weren't directly involved um, probably didn't want to see their friends or relatives being uh, massacred in these disputes. So what would happen is people would... Um, say to the two people who were in the dispute, um, we want you to go to a neutral third party and tell your story to this neutral third party and let that neutral third party make a decision and then you will follow that decision. And that neutral third party that was trusted by the, the rest of the population was usually a clergyman. And, and the clergyman would need a set of rules to go by to make these decisions about who was right and who was wrong. And so he would extract those rules from the religion, which was natural. He was a clergyman. Well, what happened was, over the years, that was working fine, but you would occasionally run into cases where uh, there would be a person who was not from the same religion as the people in this village, or they were from far, far away, and, and had a totally different religious system. So the, the, these uh, clergymen who became judges had to find a set of rules that everybody would be able to follow, would, would believe in. And that set of rules, um, based on principles common to all, came to be known as the common law. And the point in it is that Every religion teaches some set of, of rules that are um, essential for civilization to survive. And what these clergymen did was extract those rules that all the religions had in common. And there are essentially two of them. That's all, just two. The first one is, do all you have agreed to do? All religions teach that, and that is the basis of contract law. Do all you have agreed to do. And the second rule is do not encroach on other persons or their property. Again, do not encroach on other persons or their property. Now that is the basis of tort law and some criminal law uh, against theft and murder, uh, kidnapping, those sorts of things. All religions also teach that law. And those two laws became the, the basis of the common law, the law common to all. And again, those two laws were extracted from religion. So under the old common law system, and I think uh, I should point out, in my opinion, the most highly developed form of the old common law system was the old British common law. Uh, lots of areas had common law. But I think the British carried it to a higher level than anybody else. And um, they, um, the common law spread around the world with the British Empire. Lots of people got introduced to this. Um, a big part of, uh, for instance, the, the legal structure in India was originally based on British common law. Um, and, and again, 
these two rules, uh, do all you have agreed to do and do not encroach on other persons or their property, was extracted from religion. So you get to, let's say, the time of the American Revolution, and um, the American colonies have uh, British common law as their basic law, and they base um, their political decisions at that time on the assumption that there is this higher law. And the job of a court is not to make up law. In fact, the idea of making up law was considered insane. Um, the job of the court is to find law or discover the law, to try to figure out what the higher law is in any given case. And then as they make these decisions, these decisions become precedents for later decisions, and those precedents become the body of common law in the United States. So um, when we talk about higher law, we're talking about the assumption, uh, in the words of Alexander Hamilton, that the deity has established a eternal and immutable law which all humans are subject to. For instance, don't murder, don't steal, and so on. Um, now... <clears throat> Let's see, where should I go from there? <laughs> well, and societies can, like when we wrote our, con we didn't, when they wrote our constitution, <laughs> why couldn't they have just put those two laws in there and then just kind of got rid of the rest well, of it? <laughs> I wish they had. <laughs> yeah. Right, everything you just said totally contradicts the ideology of giving um, a body of people legislative power to create paper law. Yes, that's right. Um, the, the idea of, uh, of the majority voting to make up law or their representatives voting to make up law out of thin air, I mean, that, was, that was considered crazy back then. Um, Some of us still think it's crazy, Richard. <laughs> yeah, you're right, yes. <laughs> that is for sure. Um, the, the, you, know, you look at uh, the Federalist Papers. The Federalists were the ones who created the Constitution. If you look at the Federalist Papers that are explaining the Constitution, they're really clear in there. that They, figure, they think that uh, this idea of the majority of the people or the representative just making up law out of thin air is, a, is a, an insane idea. And, um, uh, you know, that... What can you say? I mean, they they were living in a world where they had to make political compromises, and they compromised away some things that they probably shouldn't have. The, I'm I'm not one of those people who regards the Constitution as uh, some perfect document that has no flaws in it. I think it has a lot of flaws in it because the people who made it were humans, and they had a lot of flaws. Now, one of the, the, the beauties of the Constitution is, that, that's so great, you know, is, is, as you mentioned at the early part of your show, the purpose of the Constitution is to control the government, to limit its power as much as possible. Well, uh, what most people don't know is that the American founders, as much as I, I uh, admire them, they didn't like each other very much, and they really didn't trust each other very much. And so they wrote the Constitution to control each other. They were each afraid that the other one would get too much power. And so because nobody trusted anybody, they wrote this document that essentially says that um, the government should be so constrained that no matter who gets control of it, he can't do much damage. Which might also explain why they set the system up for free entry, to keep the, all themselves equally able to have free entry into government. Uh, I, I'm, I didn't follow you there. Could you, could you go over that again? Well, they designed a system that allows free entry into government where everybody can, like, you know, you grow up being told you can be the president someday. Yeah. And I'm just... It just came on me that that's probably why they set it up that way, so each one of themselves could have free entry into government and thereby all have a chance to have political power. Yeah, that, that may have been a factor. I don't know. You know, we, we have the things that they wrote that we can refer to about their thinking, but we really aren't mind readers. And also you have the fact that 
they were human and they changed their minds. Mm-hmm. You know, what Thomas Jefferson believed in 1800 um, was a different thing than what he believed in 1810. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you just don't know what they were thinking on any given time, at any given time. But it is kind of easy to understand why some people think that the Constitution was divinely inspired, because it is really brilliant in some places. It's just amazing how that thing came out and, and how long it lasted um, before the socialists came along and dismantled it. That leads me to another question. Um, it was the one that... Uh I sent to you actually what how did that transpire where did we get away from the higher law and who was behind that what I mean we think we know what the purpose was obviously but how did that transpire where we went from the revolutionary days where I mean people were free and they were definitely I would say more free under King George than where we are now I mean King George didn't have the power that our government has right now definitely Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so what happened where we went from this notion of higher law to political power well um there's no as far as i know um there is no single supreme court case or uh or other sort of case that you can point to that said um this was the the spot where they switched from higher law to majority rule. Um, but, you know, what there was, was, uh, and still is, this, this decision of the Supreme Court on Obamacare a few days ago is an example, where it's just one case at a time, over one issue at a time, that made the socialist a decision. And so through a very gradual process that's taken more than 100 years, uh, the Supreme Court and a lot of other courts have gone along with this idea that the government's power um, should not necessarily be unlimited, but in any particular case it can be unlimited. Mm-hmm. And when you, you lump all the cases together, what you have is what you just described, a government that's more tyrannical than King George was. Now, um, it, one of the cases that I would point to as one of the better examples of these steps along the way was, uh, let's see, it's called um, U.S. versus Butler in 1936. And, and if any court case uh, can, be, can be singled out as the one that did it, this would be the one, in my opinion. And, and what that case was about was... Um, the clause in the Constitution that says promote the general welfare. And the Supreme Court decided that, yes, the Congress should be able to do anything that promotes the general welfare. Well, now, the promote the general welfare clause is not in the body of the Constitution. It's not part of the laws. It's the preamble, the introduction to the con- to the Constitution, and it was just a line that was put in there to try to sell the thing to the anti-federalists, and it was puffery. It was advertising puffery. Promote the general welfare. You know what the heck does that mean? Whatever you want it to mean. Exactly. It means yeah. Patriot Act. <laughs> yeah. So in in Butler versus the U.S., uh, the the, Cong, the uh, Supreme Court just inducted the preamble, the advertising puffery, into the main body of the Constitution and said the government can do whatever it wants to promote welfare. Richard, um, uh, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. On, it's kinda, it, it, it's just burning in my, my gut right now. And you mentioned earlier Thomas Jefferson, mm-hmm. and it began to click with me that really going all the way back to the westward expansion, when we purchased the Louisiana Territory, mm-hmm. and, I, and I use air quotes around purchased, mm-hmm. because the people that lived out there... <laughs> Whether they had been settlers or whether they were Native Americans or whoever was actually out there, they weren't really citizens of France mm-hmm. from whom we purchased the territory. Mm-hmm. And then beginning in the early 1800s, we're shoving people out there and taking over land in the name of what? Yeah, I mean, what, uh, exactly. What, what gave us, what, what gave our forefathers the right to just go and take land for for the the government's uses or for even individuals within the, that under the aegis of the American government, mm. isn't that a violation of common law? I can't go over yep. to Josh's house and say, Josh, 
I'm just going to take part of your your backyard here because I want to build my own house back here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's his land. Yep, you're right. You're right. Um, there's uh, there was a, well, you know, the phrase was manifest destiny, oh. uh, and that's one of the things that the kids are taught in school. Um, that the for, for some reason the federal government just had this right to go out and steal whatever it wanted because it was our manifest destiny for the federal government to own everything between the two oceans. Now, you know, where this manifest destiny came from, (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) And uh, I bet they didn't either, but it sounded good. And uh, so they went around massacring Indians and whoever else didn't want to go along with their plan. And back to your, um, back to what you were talking about with um, the higher law, your uh, comments about the Nuremberg trials, I've had uh, whole shows on here about that. Oh. I really appreciate your take on that. When, yeah, when, really. wor- when worse came to worse, they fell back on, on what is common and what's known, that there is a higher law even above government. I really yep. like that. Mm-hmm. And it's really the last case, I mean, the biggest one that we've seen. I don't think there's any, been really any one since that one. Yeah, there's nothing that I know of, uh, certainly of the stature of, of the Nuremberg trials. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I've always thought, what, what caused that? How did Maybe, maybe these uh, judges were so horrified by what had happened in the war that they were yanked out of their paradigms that they'd been taught and, and had to look at things uh, in a much more... A broad way, uh, and and maybe they went all the way back into the law of the early Middle Ages. I don't know, but but they, uh, you know, our audience may not know what we're talking about here. Um, after the end of World War II, it was held that the Nazis uh, and the Japanese leaders um, should be called to account for what they'd done. And um, and incidentally, you'll notice none of the Allied leaders were like Stalin <laughs> was worse than Hitler if you judge by the number of people he murdered, and he was not called to account. He didn't wind up at Nuremberg. Yeah. Um, but um, the Nazis were, and um, the, what the court found essentially is that there is a higher law than any government's law, and that the, uh, the Nazi government was not empowered to give itself the ability to do all these things to these innocent people that it, there is a higher law that it should have ad- adhered to, and that each of the individuals were guilty of violating that higher law and should be punished. Some of them were hung. Right. It was more than just, well, I was just following my orders. There's, no, there's a higher order that you must follow. Right. It, yeah, interestingly I, enough, though, that oh, that carries over into modern warfare to a certain degree. Like when I was in the Army, you know, less than 20 years ago, mm-hmm. as an interrogator, that was my job. Oh. I was in, uh, basically I had to make sure that I had to answer to a higher power. We were told over and over again if you are given an order that you believe to be an unlawful order, you have a duty not to obey that order. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I don't know if that's still taught, but it certainly was when I was in the army. <laughs> hey, we are coming up on the uh, the top of the hour right now, Richard. Uh, maybe are you going to stay with us for the second hour as well? Uh, yes, I will. Wonderful. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much for those of you listening online. I'm not sure how long it's going to be before the power's back on. I've got a report here that a small plane crashed into a power pole on Holmes. Oh. Right there at the beginning of our show, which is why uh, the power is out in North Pole. It's because a plane crashed into the power lines. Wow. FBI did it. We'll be right back after the Fox News with uh, a completely different show. Patriot's Lament is on the way. And welcome to Patriot's Lament right here on KFAR, local talk radio. We are streaming live at KFAR660.com and uh, normally broadcasting live on the airwaves on 660 and the AM dial. Uh, This particular morning here, we've got a uh, plane crash out in North Pole that has taken the power grid down. And uh, therefore, our transmitter is not broadcasting. But uh, we are live on the Internet, and we've had some some questions coming through uh, from our Facebook page. But, Josh, you had some more questions for our guest. Uh, Richard Mayberry is still on the line. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have uh, Richard Mayberry here from the U.S. and World Early Warning Report, also the uh, author of the Uncle Eric series, and uh, more specifically, Whatever Happened to Justice, um, Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, I'm sure... 
hopefully most of the listeners here have read that. Um, Richard, a lot of us, some of us here in particular, despise the political system so much that we have decided to not participate in the system. Um, is there legitimacy if we would just stop participating, stop deciding who's going to hold the gun to point at who? I mean, because it's so, I mean, right now we, we have this so-called choice of Obama or Romney. Is that even, I mean, I don't feel that's a legitimate choice. I mean, I, I feel like that's, okay, you're going to have the socialist gun pointing at my head or I'm going to have the fascist gun pointing at my head. So, I mean, I believe that the the system is going to collapse. I mean, economically, if you pointed out in the last hour, it's coming down, baby. Um, and I feel like it's time to pull ourselves from that system and talk about what we talked about in the last hour and what we try to talk about every week on our show is higher law. There's something better than political power. There's something better than pointing a gun at your neighbor and forcing wealth from him and forcing whatever whatever the force may be. I mean, government is nothing but force. And how do we turn that around when this collapse comes? What, what's going to happen? How are we going to turn it to whatever rises out of the ashes? Do you see we're going to turn back to political or... Uh, to the higher law standard, back to common law, or are we going to go straight fascist? Well, uh, it, I think it's a, a near certainty that some large part of the world will go fascist. And, uh, let, you know, let me real quickly mention what we're talking about with fascism. Um, it's the simplest of all political philosophies, and it boils down to just like one or two sentences, and, it, and that is that uh, uh, truth is just a matter of opinion so right and wrong are just matters of opinion and the power holders should do whatever appears necessary no exceptions and no limits now that's fascism um, and uh, we, we saw for instance in Nazi Germany where it goes but that's what people really are attracted to when they get into trouble. They want a leader who is a fascist. They won't admit that, uh, but uh, that, that's most certainly what they want. And you saw this back in the 2008 crash. Um, people who were extremely well educated, extremely knowledgeable about world affairs and history and all, were just screaming for the government to do something anything just do something um and you know that's that's fascism now um richard you actually you hear people screaming for that even without the crisis i've heard yeah. a number of my friends this year saying we just need a good guy we just need a good man in office yeah we, we just need to get the right person in office and then that'll make all the difference yeah right there's always this assumption that, that what's wrong is the wrong people are in office and if we just put the right people in office then everything will be okay um, and it totally ignores the fact that political power corrupts. It doesn't matter who you put in there. He's going to be corrupted by his power. That's what the, was so brilliant about the founding fathers in the Constitution, is they recognized that. They couldn't trust anybody. Now, um, as far as where things are going to go, um, there, we could have a period of fascism in the United States. But I, I come back to, and I'm getting more convinced of this all the time, this is pretty much in every country, including the United States, the outcome is going to be decided by the military because they're going to be the only ones that are able to function when this emergency happens. Uh, and, and whatever direction they decide to go is the direction the United States will go. Um, one of my favorite stories is, is uh, was told to me by a, a professor of Latin American history. This is long, long ago, like 45 years ago. Um, we were talking about the uh, the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and when Castro came to power, and um, he said it isn't like what you read in your history books. It, it it did not follow what the newspapers were saying. What actually happened was that the hills in Cuba were just full of guerrillas of various types and, and all sorts of different leaders there. 
and uh, the Batista government was in deep trouble financially. They had they had gotten themselves in way over their heads, and they had no idea what to do. And so they just got on a plane and left. And uh, there wasn't any uh, fighting over you know who's going to control the presidential palace or anything like that. They just got in their cars, they drove to the airport, and they flew away. <laughs> And the word got to um, the guerrillas in the hills that the presidential palace was empty, that the government was gone. There was a power vacuum now in Havana. And all of these guerrilla commanders um, started driving as fast as they could go to get to the presidential palace. And it turned out that Castro had the fastest jeep. And he arrived at the palace first, made himself president, um, and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But that's what actually happened, and I really think that if I had to bet a lot of money on what's going to happen in the United States, it's probably going to follow the Cuban model. You know, whoever gets to the White House first <laughs> is going to be the new government, and he's going to decide what direction we're going to go. What about, though, the fall of the Soviet Union, where pretty much the same thing happened, only instead of having a new centralized government, that, that the Duma basically said, well, why don't we just call the whole thing off, and dissolved mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Do you see that as a possibility? For oh, that? definitely. That's a definite possibility. I'm just saying I think the Cuban model is the most likely one. But, um, yeah, the, the idea that uh, the federal government will just go out of business and um, we'll have 51... Uh, states or 50 states, you could throw Puerto Rico in there too, 51, <laughs> sure. um, and, and um, that they will, uh, you know, just essentially be independent countries. Uh, that's a very good possibility, and I kind of tend to think I'd like to see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to agree with you. Not alone, not alone. <laughs> the, um, the nice thing, one of the nice things about it would be that you'd have 50 different experiments Mm -hmm. of which kind of government that people should have. And it would become apparent pretty quickly which ones were crazy and which ones really had merit. Um, and uh, the population would uh, migrate in the direction of the ones that provided the best way of life. Uh, and by that means, you know, we'd have, have a, actually a laboratory experiment about what works best. And uh, we would find a two or three or four models there, maybe, that would be great, and then they would be adopted by the others. Hmm. A free market society, hopefully, would be one of the ones that emerged. <laughs> yeah, we can hope. Yeah. yeah. What is your, just the, what are your feelings on being a part of the system right now? I know, and voting and stuff, I know I, I told you in an earlier email that we were um, anarcho-capitalist, and I saw your uh, interview with uh, Jeff Berwick when you were at the Casey Summit. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, year, year and a half ago or whatever. So what is your, I guess your personal beliefs, what what are your beliefs on voting? And we had a show last week on uh, the lesser of two evils where no matter, especially in this presidential election, you're, I mean, even our caller said, well, you know, I'm going to vote for Romney. Well, don't you believe that he's probably evil? Yeah, well, yeah, but he's less evil. How do you justify that? Because we, I can't. I can't justify voting for evil, participating in evil. I understand self-defense. I mean, at a local level, if there's a issue that comes up or a property tax or whatever, a bond, I can think, oh, yeah, maybe I should go vote that down so I don't get more money stolen from me. Mm -hmm. So what are your opinions on those things? Well, um, uh, the, the the idea of voting um, and voting for the lesser of the evils, mm -hmm. you know, the lesser of the evils is evil. <laughs> um, and um, the, the fact that it's it's the lesser, I think, doesn't really bother uh, the evil entities in the world very much, you know? Right. Yeah. Assuming that there is a Satan. I don't know if there is or not, but if there is, he doesn't really care if you vote for the worst of them or not. He just wants you to vote for one of them, just so you're going in his direction. That's what he wants. So he can, he, you know, he does it every every election. He throws these two candidates out. Both are evil, one not so so much as the other, and people all go out and vote for evil. 
And <laughs> <laughs> we're just perpetuating this thing. Though. I mean, we just keep, yeah. keep it going and going and going. It's just like, I guess the one thing we look at is that in keeping it going, eventually it's going to collapse. But, I mean, th- there's. do you think it's legitimate to not per- to not participate? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if it's a free country, then it's up to you whether you participate or right. not. Uh, you know, that's you, you, what freedom's about. Uh, just, one, one of my issues, though, with all of that, I mean, you look at Nazi Germany. How many people would, would that say, well, of course I participated with the Nazis? Oh, of course I did. It was, it was, you know, it was the patriotic thing to do. Well, they wouldn't have any legitimacy, would they? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. You still get back to this pragmatic thing, uh, as you point out. Um, you know, we don't know how many of the Germans did it because they did it out of fear or how many did it just because they were feathering their own nests uh, mm-hmm. or because they really believed in what he said. There were some that did. Uh, you don't really know, but um, I think it just comes down to um, yeah, go ahead and vote if you want, but don't expect anything good to come out of it. Right. <laughs> we got a lot of, uh, last week when we were saying that we were not going to be voting, I was just amazed how many people called in angry. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. dare you not vote? That's your mm-hmm. it's your duty to vote. It's your American patriotic thing to do, and that's your way to change. And basically we came back with, how's that been working out for you? Yeah, right. And of course, not voting is a vote for Obama automatically. Yeah. That's what everyone yeah. thinks, but yeah. yeah. Well, you could paint that picture, but you know, I I kind of look at that and think, well, the, Obama winning may not be such a bad thing. Now, I'm not re- I'm not recommending it, but I'm just want to <laughs> I want to lay a possibility in front of you here that maybe you should think about. Um, I am convinced that we're headed for a much much worse economic catastrophe, and whoever's in power at that time is going to get blamed for it. <laughs> Uh, now, do you do you want uh, Romney, who who talks a little about free markets? Do you want him blamed for it, or do you want this socialist to get blamed for it? Yeah, we had that discussion with about Ron Paul, who we uh, love. Ron Paul, love his stand for liberty and his unchanging determination for liberty in the 30 years that he's been involved in politics, or at least the, in the 30 years he's been on the scene. And we had this discussion one time. Was would you really want Ron Paul to be in power when the economy collapses? Because who are they going to blame? Mm-hmm. Free market Ron Paul. Look at how it. <laughs> obviously, yep. the Keynesians were right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I I had kind of a a small personal crisis over that because Ron is an old friend of mine, and um, fortunately, um, I don't think he's got a, a prayer of actually winning the presidency <laughs> now, so it's not a problem. Right. right. <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> there, there's a question in the, on, from our Facebook page that I think ties in in terms of the Keynesian aspect there. Uh, Brent Bernstein asks, can you ask Mr. Bayberry what he thinks that will move velocity? Most people are scared to spend money, and even though QE3 may be around the corner, what makes him think that velocity will increase? Um, I think one possibility is Romney getting elected. Uh, if Romney gets elected... Um, well, backing up a little bit here and pointing out that um, the business community and the investing community are scared out of their minds of Obama uh, because they know he's socialist and they know that if he gets reelected, he doesn't have another election in his future, and so he'll be pretty much free to do anything to them that he wants to. And he has already gone on record, his mother says, that he has referred to business as the enemy. So um, that's a whole lot of the fear right there. Um, and when people are afraid, they don't want to spend, they don't want to invest, they they want to stick their money in the mattress and, and sit and wait to see what will happen. <laughs> so that's the same thing as taking the money out of circulation. It's, a, it's very deflationary, and that's the situation we're in right now. Um, if if Romney is elected, I think there will be a big sigh of relief among millions of investors and business owners, and that all by itself will cause a boost in spending, and um, you know people will start letting go of their money, um, 
and um, conditions will improve for a while. Uh, that's one thing that can cause velocity to take off, and I think it could be the most likely one right now. Uh, but there are others that are that are fairly likely too. Um, we don't know which one's going to happen, but one of them would simply be that in the next few weeks, perhaps, the Federal Reserve will print a whole lot more money, inject it into the economy, and um, that will frighten people around the world so much that they will start bailing out of money. And bailing out of money means trading it for something else. It means buying stuff, whether it's investments or cars or whatever. Uh, so another QE could be enough to trigger a panicky flight from the dollar and a boost in velocity, which would give you a, a at least brief uh, economic boom. But that doesn't do anything to actually alter the path that we're on. True, because we have this thing called malinvestment. Mm -hmm. uh, when a government injects money into the economy, when it counterfeits a whole bunch of money and goes out and spends it and injects it into the economy, um, the money doesn't all go to the entire population uniformly. Some people get a lot, some people get less, and some people get none at all. And the people who get a lot of it, they need to do something with it, uh, and they buy things and they invest in things. And so you get these hot spots in the economy. There are various things become fashionable, and lots of people get into them. So these hot spots occur, and then businesses move into these hot spots to take advantage of these increased flows of money, and they, they build factories and offices and all sorts of other things uh, to satisfy these demands in these hot spots. Well, at some point, the government stops printing the money, and the flow of money to these hot spots dries up. The hot spots go cold, and that is the shakeout of the malinvestment. The, the plant and equipment that was put there in response to these injections of money is malinvestment. It is uh, what they call capital formation in places and doing things that it should not have. Uh, the business people were misled into making investments they should not have made. And so any time you have a QE or a quantitative easing injection of money into the economy, there are hot spots created that are actually clusters of malinvestment, and that malinvestment has to be shaken out at some point. Or the shakeout is a depression. Um, it's a, the, the depression is not a problem. It's a solution to the creation of the malinvestment that occurred in the previous inflation. Um, and so... Um, if we just keep putting it off, though, isn't it going to make it worse when it finally happens? Yep, absolutely. Um, if if we'd have taken uh, the shakeout back, oh, I don't know, when, let's say in, the 19, in 1960, uh, hmm. the government had stopped printing money altogether for the rest of mankind, for the rest of time in 1960 and never printed any money again and so never created malinvestment again um, we wouldn't have the space program yeah that's true yeah there are probably lots of things that our government created that we wouldn't have and um, at the same time all that malinvestment wouldn't be created and we wouldn't be sitting on this pent up amount of malinvestment that, that must be just unimaginable we won't know until the shakeout's all over with, and we've seen what's gone under. But I think, um, you know, again, you know, the the economic calamity that we are set up for here now, because all governments have gone socialist, is unimaginable. Much bigger than the Great Depression. And uh, as you say, I mean, the further they kick the can down the road, the more malinvestment accumulates, and the worse the economic crash is going to be. Well, we can't have any wars if the government quits creating money, though. That's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just uh, I finished your book, well, it's been a little bit, um, about ancient Rome, mm -hmm. and I thought that was just fascinating. Just fascinating how we're going down the exact same road, especially militarily. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty sad. It's really sad. Yeah. And what Steve said about the, uh, we wouldn't have a space program, if the government had stopped in the 60s, maybe enough free market wealth would have been created where we would have a free enterprise space space program where actually there was some profit made out of it. 
<laughs> no, yeah. Instead of uh, mm-hmm. the malinvestment we have now. But can we, uh, would you be against taking some phone calls? They're oh, no, no, please from. do. All right, let's well, see, see if this works here. 458 Talk is a number. Are you still there, caller? Yes, this is Randy. Good morning, Randy. I assume you know, of course, that you are not transmitting, right? Yes. What? Yeah, we, we uh, did you know it's because a plane crashed on Holmes Road in North Pole? Oh, I did not know that. Now you do, yes. Yeah, and I assume you're still talking because you know you're going over the Internet or something like that. Yeah. I, I'm not listening to the Internet, but anyway, so I missed a whole bunch of your show. Uh, that's mainly what I called in, but, but since I'm here, uh, I really appreciate your guest. Uh, Mr. Mayberry, I have you. read your article, The War That Will Kill the Dollar, some time ago. That mm-hmm. was interesting. And I would like to just simply say that I really agreed very much with a statement you made last hour before you went off the air in which you said, in a world saturated with political power, you better get some political power or you're going to be toast. (laughs) And I think that's very valid, and I really appreciate your statement you made just a few minutes ago about the psychological effects of the election where you said that business people, investors, are scared scared of Obama and they're just holding on to their money and that... uh, Business people might very well break free with their money and, and spend and invest if Romney gets elected. They'll have a sigh of relief, you said, and so I appreciate that. And mm-hmm. uh, and uh, oh, uh, one other thing uh, on the voting thing, since that was brought up, I want to say that I agree with a big part of uh, Josh and Aaron's uh, viewpoint on the voting. On the one hand, I am very much in you know against taking away anybody's right to vote, of course. But I would very strongly advocate that left-wingers and liberals stay home and not vote. I mean, I, I wish we could persuade them not to vote. I'd feel a lot better. Yeah. And that's that's all it basically all right. had. Could we clarify something real quick, Richard, when you said something about you better get uh, political power or you'll get squashed? You weren't necessarily advocating political power when you were you? No. No. Certainly not. No, I'm just saying the reality that people have to live in is that if they don't have political power in the world we live in today, they're going to get squashed. Much like saying if you're going to go and live in uh, a headhunter territory, you better learn how to cut people's heads off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or get a really big gun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one other thing, too, is that I, I, I wanted to clarify what you were saying in terms of that the movement of the money if Romney gets elected. That's not necessarily a good thing. Oh, I, I don't think so, but we, we really don't know about Romney. He's never, as far as I know, he's never disclosed what his economic paradigm is. For all we know, you know, the guy could maybe be an Austrian, and, and you know, he's never said. Yeah. Yeah. But along those lines, he might also be a Martian. I mean, we actually yeah. have no yeah. idea whatsoever. We're up on the Fox News. Richard Mayberry is on the line, and we're going to go back to the phone lines and see if anybody is still holding after the break. Right here on Patriots Lament on KFAR, online at KFAR660.com. Got our sunshine and lollipops on this morning. I'm Steve yeah. Floyd, and this is uh, Patriots Lament, joining us in the studio from Far North Tactical, where you can get ready for the zombie apocalypse. Uh, Aaron Bennett is here. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. And from Bighorn Enterprises, where performance matters, we've got Josh Bennett in here as well. Good morning. John. Good morning. And on the line, of course, Richard Mayberry, a prolific author, and uh, also you do the, the newsletter the early warning report mm-hmm. and good morning yes and just to clarify again with our last caller i got <laughs> i actually got emails right away on that that uh, the point was missed on that caller randy he's a he's a regular caller on the show but the point you weren't saying that mitt romney being elected to president of the united states was necessarily going to be a economic recovery if anything it would uh, boost malinvestment yeah it would it would um it would tend to increase uh, velocity of circulation of the dollar for a little while, probably, and that would give us a bump, let's say, um, and uh, things would look better for a while. And they would be better for a little while, but it's, it would peter out pretty quick. Now, of course, that would depend on what Romney actually does, and we don't know that because he, he doesn't really give very many specifics. Uh, he gives a lot of promises. Yeah, well, watching the presidential debates when Ron Paul was talking about economics and stuff, the question when they would center around economics and he would start talking about Austrian economics and watching the lost in space look on Romney's face, I'm not really confident that he understood anything 
that Ron Paul was talking about. Question, question from Facebook uh, from Dan Schwartz. He asks, question uh, for Mayberry here. Who, who was the British ruler who went back to the gold standard? Went back to the gold standard. So I guess he's talking about after World War I. Um, in, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the name. Hmm. Um, the, what happened was, in order to pay for World War I, the Brits went off of the gold standard and printed a whole lot of pounds in order to pay for it, for the war. Um, and then after, after the war, they went back on the gold standard again. Um, but they picked the wrong price, and that helped lead to the Great Depression. Wow. So they're manipulating it. I mean, people don't understand. It's hard for people to understand that the gold standard alone isn't what would fix things. You have to let let money decide. People have to decide what the money is and what the value is, not the right, the, not the government. Anyways, right. should we take some more calls? Mm-hmm. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning. This is Patriots the Mend. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? This is Nelson. Nelson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayberry, I'm a subscriber to your newsletter for a number of years, and well, thank I've you. read your books as well. Thank you very much for all your writing, everything uh, that you do. Thank you. Um, quick question. Mm-hmm. I remember a year or so ago in your newsletter, you wrote that you and your wife had had a number of conversations about whether to stay in the country or leave the country um, as the government builds kind of a new iron curtain around our borders Mm -hmm. and you said that at at the time you chose to stay so wondering if you could comment on other people who are uh, thinking about that question as well what are some of the pros and cons and is there a trigger point or trigger points that would make you change your decision and uh, seriously consider expatriating and leaving the country. Yeah, well, there is a trigger point, I guess, but I, I don't know. Specifically, I could give you a list of things, you know, uh, but um, it's it's hard to really say what's likely to happen. I don't know. Um, could if, you give some examples? Oh, sure. I mean, if you begin to see uh, uh, summary judgments uh, in the courts um, or... Um, you know, just uh, thing, you know, cases where police are um, shooting suspects without trials, uh, summary executions, those sorts of things. I would probably get out of the country if, if those sorts of things happen. And, and uh, the problem is, where do you run to? Because, again, every government in the world has swallowed the poison pill of socialism, and they're all going down the tubes. That's why this thing is so scary to people, is it's worldwide. For the first time in all of world history, this is worldwide. It's happened on a country-by-country basis before, but never worldwide. Which is why I'm reluctant to leave the country, because no matter where you go, it's uh, very likely to be just a carbon copy of what we're going to be going through here. Um, Now, the thing is, in all probability, there will be... Uh, lots of places that will be very good places, but we don't know what those places are. If you have the financial resources to set up um, refuges or havens in several other countries, um, I say go do it. it it's a great idea. Uh, most people don't have that kind of money. They don't don't have the ability. So you know, what a lot of people are 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 led to believe is they can just pick some place that's going to be safer and they can just go there and start a new life. And I don't believe that. Um, there, There's an old story um, from World War II where there was a, a family that lived in Europe and they saw World War II coming and they realized that Europe was not going to be a good place to be and so they searched all over the world for the safest place they could find and um, they they found a uh, island in the South Pacific where they could set up their a farming operation, and they could live on that island and be totally divorced from the rest of what was going on in the world. So they moved th- their lives to this island in the South Pacific, and that island turned out to be Guadalcanal. Oh no! 
Wow. Uh, so, totally invaded yeah. by the Japanese and decimated by the Americans. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, that, that, that raises the question, something that Aaron has said a number of times on uh, my programs here in terms of if you were a Jew in Germany, mm-hmm. you may have had a bunch of money leading up toward World War II, uh, and you see that the warning signs coming. Uh, if you don't get out when you can, it's eventually you can't get out. Right. So, yeah, so you have to be vigilant. There's no doubt about it, and, and be prepared to, to cut and run. Um, hopefully you won't have to. But, again, you're going to run into the problem of where you're going to go, um, and I don't know an answer to that. I, I think Switzerland probably will be okay. I think New Zealand probably will be okay. But they're going to be surrounded by so much chaos for the, in the rest of the world that you just don't know. Right, but, I mean, um, like Josh and I have looked looked at maybe going to some different places. I've been leaning mostly towards places that government aren't all-powerful. I mean, as far as um, their um, ability to oppress you directly, not necessarily being um, extremely free and all that, but just not having the resources. Yeah, um, but uh, uh, very often... Well, I guess in every case I can think of off the top of my head, the ones that don't have the resources to oppress you don't have them because those countries are extremely poor, um, and they they just uh, they can't they can't shoot you because they don't have the money to buy guns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got we've got questions on the phone and questions on the web. Actually, we've got a question coming in from Spinoza's Gourmet Pizza in Ohio, listening online this morning. Uh, but before we go to that, let's go to the phones here. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? You said. Hello, my own. This is Dan from Connecticut. Okay, Dan. Yeah, hi. I had a uh, kind of a comment and a question. Um, it just amazed me, like when we had the the last stimulus, how many people supported it and, and were in favor of it, and I just I find that there's this complacency in supporting what the government wants to do. And one of the things I would, I would point out, and I sort of ask this question, well, don't you think that um, the best way for the government to stimulate the economy would be to start, for it to start paying down its debt? If you like water for, for somebody who's drunk trying to avoid a hangover, they could maybe uh, alleviate some of the, what's coming ahead. So I just wanted to get uh, Rick's comment about that, paying down the debt and how that could stimulate the economny. Okay, could, could, could you? It off. Hi, could could one of our uh, announcers here repeat that? I had trouble understanding. You had it. trouble understanding it, Josh. Did you understand the question? I think he was asking, um, wouldn't one of the better things to do for our government right now to pay down our debt? That was one of the things that he asked. Is that a legitimate thing for them to do to pay down our debt? Or I kind of think it's a little past that right now, but <laughs> that's really true. It's. <laughs> Yeah, there was a day when it was a feasible idea, but um, now um, I, I hate I hate that I have never really thought through the implications of paying down the debt under such a burden that they have. But I don't think it would be any any improvement over the mess we already have. Now, the way governments generally declare bankruptcy and and uh, go out of business is just by inflating their debts away. Um, the money just becomes worthless, and then they pay it off. Um, and I think that's the most likely thing to happen. Um, there could be some attempt to pay down the debt, but it's so enormous that you would have to pay it down so in such large quantities that those quantities would cause big disruptions, I would think. Uh, yeah, I've got that question from, uh, this is from Spinoza's Gourmet Pizza and Salads. That's there in Early Warning Subscriber in Ohio. She says, um, I own a small yet profitable restaurant speaking solely about economic conditions. Do you consider it wise to invest in expanding locations over the next year? Uh, yeah, if they're the right locations, um, um, I would... I'm I, off the top of my head. I'm I'm trying to think of, of what locations I would want to put a restaurant in, and I and I can't think of anything right now. But there will definitely, I think, over the next year to eighteen months, I think there will definitely be some hot spots in the economy uh, due to quantitative easing. 
Um, but uh, I would have to think about it to, to make a specific recommendation. All right. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? You still there? All right. looks like uh, they didn't hold, so we'll go ahead and drop that other line there. And uh, Josh, back to you. The lines are open. Yeah, we're sorry we haven't... I guess we should be sharing Richard a little more than we have been. So, guys, keep calling in. We've had the phone lines yeah. pretty held held up for quite a while. Um, I was just thinking back with uh, we. I have looked at leaving the country myself, and pretty interesting what your comment was on that. And it is a good point. Where do you go? I mean, the whole. It's very interesting. This go around, the whole world is going to be affected. And it seems like no matter where you are, your neighbor is going to be worse off. Or, I mean, like you said, with Switzerland, they're surrounded by some of the worst chaos that's coming. Which can They you always have been, though. Yeah, that's true. They have been. Can you explain chaos, Dan? Uh, yeah. Um, that's a chaos, Dan, uh, C-H-A-O-S-T-A-N, is a term that I coined in 1992, um, and that... Um, it's become kind of widely uh, circulated. Um, Newsweek found that the Pentagon and the CIA have been uh, paying attention to that, the, the model that goes, you know, that lays behind the chaos stand label. Um, now apparently somebody there reads my stuff. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, chaos stand, let's see, backing up. Um, after oh after I started the American Revolution after the American Revolution um, the rest of the world saw the uh, the liberty and prosperity that America had and and uh, the country was growing really fast people were far more prosperous than in other countries and other countries wanted that kind of freedom and prosperity themselves I shouldn't say countries I should say other populations wanted that freedom and prosperity themselves and so a lot of uh, the American principles began to spread around the world um, and uh, the, the areas that by let's say the 1970s were referred to as the free world are the places where the American pr- principles took root but um, socialism was coming on strong and essentially it became more popular and it stopped the spread of the American principles. And the, the most important area that never received those principles is what I call chaos, Stan, and that is um, East Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Now, those areas um, have always been just a vast sea of blood and destruction uh, because they never did have these principles, these old common law principles, and uh, they didn't get them because socialism stopped the spread uh, before they got a chance. And so what I was predicting in 1992 is that that area would just dissolve into this, you know, more war and, and destruction, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and it is still happening. There are lots of wars still going on over there, and, and they're spreading. Um, the recent... Uh, situation in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, I think, is leading to another big one. Uh, so that's essentially what chaos Dan is, the area that never received the American principles and therefore slid into chaos after the fall of the Soviet empire. Um, that Soviet structure disappeared, and there was no benign system to replace it, and they went back to their old ways of killing each other. <laughs> Funny how that's always the default. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it well, is. We, we got all the lines full again, so let's go back to the... 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Are you there? We'll try the next line. Good morning. State your name. Who's this? Is it Josh in Florida? Josh, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Mayberry. It's, it's nice to speak Hello. with you. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you. Our question for you is, if the printed money caused the bubble in real estate, what, if anything, is preventing gold from being in a bubble at this current time? And what would be the difference between now and, say, I guess it was the, what, the late 70s, where silver prices got really high and then the value of it dramatically fell? So what 
what is the difference now and then, and you know what prevents it from being in the same situation that real estate was in, you know, throughout you know the last few years. Well, I don't think that uh, anybody ever predicted that gold and silver would just take off and go straight on up and and never pause along the way. Um, so you're you're you know there's no such thing usually as a runaway inflation that just takes straight off and keeps on going until the money dies. There's usually pauses along the way, deflationary pauses. We're going through a deflationary pause right now, which is why the Federal Reserve is getting really nervous and thinking about starting another QE. Um, And it's that deflationary pause that you're seeing in the prices of the precious metals. That's what happened back in the early 80s, too. Um, The Fed really clamped down back then, really raised uh, interest rates and and tightened down the money supply, and gold and silver crashed then. Uh, We could have another crash in gold and silver now. If if they don't loosen up, um, I expect we probably would. But that doesn't say anything about the long term. And the long term is they're going to print more money. And uh, so those metals in the long term, and I'm talking three years or more, I think the trend is going to continue on up. Okay. Thanks for the call. Mm -hmm. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. You're on Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hi, this is Eric. Can you hear me? Eric, yes. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from uh, Houston, Texas, actually. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. What's on your mind today? Uh, Well, I was just wondering if, I mean, uh, Mr. Mayberry's said during the program, I think, at some point to try and be prepared, and other people are saying the same thing. I'm just wondering if maybe he could take a little time to explain in really simple terms what the average Joe, simple steps the average Joe could take to uh, prepare for a potential economic or governmental collapse. Yeah, um, it depends a lot on where you live. You have to assess your physical location and then make sure that you can be self-sufficient there for at least three months. Um, You know, somebody who lives in uh, Key West is going to make different preparations than somebody who lives in Montana. So uh, you have to judge where you live and and just start making a list of the things you would need to be safe and secure and comfortable for at least three months living there. Obviously, that includes food and water and your your necessary medications. Um, if you live uh, anywhere near any kind of a population center to speak of, uh, you should have some weapons to be able to defend yourself and your family. I think the crime rate is going to be hmm. really nasty for quite a while. Um, and, and by all means, get trained on them. Don't just go buy them, go to the range once and practice and think you've done it. Get really well trained so you know what you're doing and you know when you can and can't use them. Um, and beyond that, I, I don't know, other than you know, starting to get specific about, you know, mm-hmm. you should buy this particular kind of freeze-dried potatoes, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Thanks for the call. Appreciate that. We do have a question for you from online from our Facebook page from uh, Nelson Martin. He asks, are you familiar with Jim Davies' The Online Freedom Academy? And what's your opinion of the effort to systematically educate a big chunk of the population on the evil of government and collapse the government by withdrawing our support? Well, as far as the uh, online course there, I am not familiar with it, and I'm not qualified to say anything about it. As far as, you know, educating the whole population, um, that's what I'm trying to do, and that's what you folks are trying to do, um, to withdraw our support. Um, you know, that's, uh, I don't really know what that means. Um, you, as, as you folks have pointed out, you, you convince people that, um, the government is, is really out to just take care of itself and, and, you know, give the shaft to everybody else. But, um, uh, they still go out and vote. So is voting <laughs> supporting the government? I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, maybe a better term instead of withdrawing support is withdrawing consent. 
Yeah, but even at that, what does that mean? Yeah. Now, am I going to stop paying my taxes? No, I'm not. I, I pay all of them because I'm scared to death of those people. Sure. No, there, that is a good point. I mean, I think you have to look at what areas you can safely withdraw your consent from. Otherwise, like you just said, you'll be dead. <laughs> yeah, right. They're going to get you. They're, they're, that's one of the things to keep in mind. They're going to be looking for people to make examples out of. Mm-hmm. Um so, Which goes back to that issue of collapsing the government. We don't necessarily want to collapse the government. We just want to not participate or be yeah. a part of it. Right, yeah. Yeah, if the whole thing was was uh, voluntary, you know, if people who are statists, who really believe in big government, could go participate in this thing by themselves and not drag you and me into it, that would be fine. <laughs> Let them have it. But uh, but they want to drag us in there with them. And, <laughs> you know, that's what's immoral about it. Yeah, that seems to be the problem. All right, we're back to the phones. 458-TALK is a number. Good morning, and welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, are you there? We'll try the next line. Good morning. All right, we've managed to clear the lines again. Richard, we've got uh, less than five minutes left in the program, and I, I'm dying to ask you, Okay. As as far as all of this is going, a lot of the questions that you've been asked today have had to do with what-ifs. A lot of the questions you've had to ask have been specifics, like what should we do. Uh, my question for you, I've been dying to ask, is what do you honestly think? Not would you like, not what would you would you like to see happen, but what do you honestly see happening to the United States within the next, well, uh, in the wake of this coming election? Um, the, I think the the scenario that has the highest probability is the Cuban scenario where the day will come where the government will have created so much chaos that Congress and the Supreme Court and the uh, President, they're just not going to go to work that day. They're going to disappear. And then it's going to be in the hands of the military, and you will have a general, a four-star general, is going to be in the White House, and he's going to say, don't worry, everybody, I've got things under control. And then once he's off the air, he's going to say to himself, oh, my God, what do I do now? <laughs> and and uh, he is then going to be stuck with making the decisions and, and it, whether or not this guy really understands what this country is about is going to determine what our future will be. That does not fill me with uh, a lot of hope. Cause I, I, you know, I, I was in the military for five years, and what I saw it rising to the top in the military back then I've seen more of it since the time I've been out watching what's been going on in Afghanistan and Iraq is that you have some very, very political animals mm-hmm. in the military uh, and especially at the top levels, the generals. I, I mean, I, I don't know if we could see a civil war coming out of it, but certainly I don't see you know, people just uh, you know going along with what one general says. I, I see I see infighting coming from that. It, you don't I see an the alarm? non-aggression principle? Right, exactly. <laughs> I don't see a non-aggression. I mean, I mean am, I, am I an alarmist for, for thinking that or, or by suggesting that? Or, or, or do you think that that's also, I mean, a, an equal well, possibility that we are going to degenerate into some kind of a civil war? Well, yeah, I, you know, I think you, your, your ideas are, are realistic. And I think that, uh, yeah, the military does have a lot of those kinds of people in it. But I have seen something changing in the last 10 years or so. Um, I, I never thought I would have said this in, in my life. You know, when I was in the military myself back in the 60s, um, I, I did not regard them as the best kind of people. Um, the, but in the last 10 years or so, something has changed. And the ones that I meet are really sharp people. There are exceptions. But I'm I'm seeing that there's a new breed of soldier out there, and um, I'm hopeful that um, they're smarter and they're more dedicated to honest principles than they were in the past. Hmm. Well, that's good. Before we do run out of time, I want to just uh, get your website out again. People can find Mr. Mayberry at Chaos Stan. Dot com. It's C-H-A-O-S-T-A-N dot com. And we're going to be posting this show on our website, which is PatriotsLament dot blogspot dot com. There's another PatriotsLament dot com, so you got to make sure you throw in the blog, dot blogspot. blogspot. So and Patriots, also on our YouTube channel, which is... Our YouTube channel is Radio, Radio Free, Free Fairbanks. Fairbanks. So, All right. Mr. Mayberry, I guess 
we're at the top of the hour. We're, we're out of time. Thank you very much for being with us. It's been enjoyable, and uh, thank you all for the uh, the callers from the around the country today. Yeah, that was if you great. enjoyed what you're hearing, please uh, listen again next week. We will be online again. Thank you, Richard. Thank very you very much. much. And, uh, of course, coming up next, it's Health Talk right here on KFAR. We're Local Talk Radio. Check us out online, kfar660.com. And if you'd like to email the show you just heard, the address is patriotslament at gmail.com. And uh, that's it for the day. See you next week right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio.